Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode, and today marks a great moment. We have now been invested in this portfolio for six months. Last week we hit the six month mark, and I started investing in this portfolio on April 3rd of 2020, and from the time I'm filming this, and it should be released to you guys, this will be released to you guys on October 14th, so about a month and a couple of days. But six months in this portfolio has taught me a lot, and we've seen a lot of growth for not only the dividend income, but the portfolio value as well. We started this portfolio with a $1,500 deposit right here on April 3rd. I started the channel and posted my first video that following Monday on April 6th. And then now if we fast forward all the way here today until October 13th, it is now almost a $7,000 portfolio. And more importantly, regardless of what the portfolio is worth, those of you that watch me, those of you that watch my channel, you know that I'm focused on the dividend income. My dividend income, my first purchase started at $66.67, and now today it is currently almost $200. And this is actually updated monthly, so now if you count the deposits, it's actually quite a bit more than $200. It's actually about $230, $240. But regardless, this is some great growth for my portfolio. So throughout this video, I wanted to go over a few different things. The first one was I wanted to show you a few different key metrics of the portfolio. I wanted to show you some stocks that I've owned since day one in the portfolio, have never sold out of, and a lot of these I don't plan on selling out of anytime soon. A lot of these blue chip companies like a Johnson & Johnson, a Pepsi, JP Morgan, a lot of these companies I likely will intend on owning till the day that I die. But regardless, I want to show you a few different things about that. And then after we move on from my portfolio, I wanted to get into some news. And in speaking of stocks that I own in my portfolio, this is a stock that I recently owned. I sold out of this company in September of 2020. So I owned it for several months, but the reason why I sold it at IBM was for a couple different reasons. But they just recently announced last week that they are planning to spin off their IT infrastructure unit and focus strictly on their hyper cloud growth business, specifically with their Red Hat acquisition. I'll be going over that, how it will affect shareholders, how it will change the direction of the company, and then also I'll be going over the good and the bad news for IBM, especially going over the reasons why I sold it and even why throughout this acquisition it is not going to be something that I'm going to be following along with because their balance sheet and their income statement is not something that I particularly like and that's something we'll be going over here and then next up just a brief shout out okay I didn't want to dive into this too hard if you go into the description of my videos I have links for referrals to Robinhood I have links to referrals for M1 Finance I have links for lots of other stuff but as far as brokerages I am not a big supporter of Robinhood, but I just keep the link down in my description just for those of you people that like to use it. Now, I think Robinhood is not as good as a brokerage as M1 Finance, not knocking those who use it, but there is a couple reasons why, and this is one of them. This article came out a couple days ago. Robinhood users say accounts were looted with no one to call. Now, regardless, before we talk about their customer service, I just wanted to use this as a public service announcement. I'm not going to bash on Robinhood. I don't care what brokerage you're using. I don't care if you're investing in the one finance with Robinhood or anything in between. Do not set up an account without two-factor authentication. Do everything you possibly can to secure your account, have a very secure password that is very hard to replicate, and make sure that your money is safe. Because I don't care if you have $100 invested or $100 million invested, no one wants to see that money fraudulently taken away from them. So yeah, this is a public service announcement. Go ahead and make sure your account is safe and secure. Thank you. And then last but not least, we're going to go over one different piece of news in this video. I just wanted to briefly mention the federal deficit, okay? The balance sheet for the Federal Reserve is getting out of hand. And basically, I wanted to show these quick words here from Jerome Powell. I had a minute video that pretty much wrapped it up. So I want to go ahead and show you this right here. So go ahead and watch it right now. You know, I'm, I, for many years, I've been, before the Fed, I have long time been an advocate for of the need for the United States to return to a sustainable path. Uh, from a fiscal perspective at the federal level. We have not been on such a path for some time, which means just means that the, that the, the debt is growing faster than the economy. Um, this is not the time to act on those concerns. This is the time to use the great fiscal power of the United States to, to do what we can to support the economy and try to get through this with as little damage to the longer run productive capacity of the economy as possible. The time will come again and reasonably soon, I think, where we can, where we can uh, think about a long-term way to get our fiscal house in order, and we absolutely need to do that. But this is not the time to be, uh, in my personal view, this is not the time to, to let that concern, which is a very serious concern, but to let that uh, get in the way of us winning this battle, really. 
Okay, so that was Jerome Powell right there, and you heard his words about the federal deficit. Now is not the time to be worrying about that type of stuff. They're focused on the economy, which I get it, and that is very understandable, which is the last thing that I want to mention in this video. I wanted to just briefly mention the GDP. I know we went over this recently, but I just wanted to mention that and how it relates to this federal deficit. But overall, guys, before I jump into the news about the federal deficit, before I jump into the news about IBM and how they're spinning off its business, and before I start going over all my portfolio, I just wanted to briefly mention if you're not familiar with me and if you're not familiar with my channel my name is Jordan I'm the millennial investor I track my annual dividend income my monthly dividend income my portfolio and my monthly YouTube income and disclose everything throughout my channels from my buys my sales my dividends everything in between my referral money and there's my YouTube income broke down by category and these are the 27 stocks that I own and what they pay me on an annual basis on this first column and column a and if you want to support me and my channel one of the ways that you can do that is go ahead and use this referral link that is down in the description we have 46 people signed up so if you're watching this video and you want to help contribute to my channel or you want to help support me go ahead and get this number up to 47 i would really appreciate it and like i said this link is down in the description and in speaking of stuff down in the description this portfolio is also down there as well so if you want to follow along with me or even invest in my portfolio personally this link is down in the description so go ahead and check that out and there's also lots of other things like referral links to yada savings accounts to credit card referrals to mentoring ship calls with me so you can speak with me on the phone one-on-one -on -one, and lots of other things so go ahead and check it out down below thank you very much and here's the 27 stocks that i currently own and what i'm up or down on them in the target weightings that i have but thank you guys so much and let's go ahead and get into the video now if we go ahead and look at my portfolio here you can see that it's had some great growth and what I wanted to do was I wanted to show one stock that really shows the growth firsthand. So you see a lot of my top holdings here. All these holdings pay me quarterly. This is a dividend growth portfolio. So what my goal here is, I do like to chase a little bit of yield. I do like to get a good yield in my portfolio. But what I really want to focus on is dividend growth, right? I want to every single year get a higher payout than I did the previous. And I want to do that in a couple different ways. I want to do that through more deposits. I want to do that through dividend reinvestments. I want to do that through dividend raises and a number of different things, right? So if we go to my holdings here, my 27 holdings, this is a preview. So if you guys go to the description and you pull up my portfolio, this is the view that you guys will get. My portfolio currently has about a 3.3% yield, which by the way, this is the trailing 12 months at TTM dividend yield. So it's actually probably going to be a little bit higher than that, probably closer to about 3.4. But all these holdings pay me quarterly, with the exception of one. 26 out of the 27 pay me quarterly, but one of them pays me monthly, and that's this stock right here. Realty Income, currently almost a 4.5% yielding stock, and it's down quite significantly today. Good thing I bought some this morning. But if I go to this holding, if we go here and we click Activity, and we go to dividends only, right? So this will show all my dividends, and I'll be showing all of them in just a second. But I wanted to go to symbol first, and I just wanted to show realty income. Now, realty income had a 60% payout my first month I owned it. The following month, it went up to 70 cents. The following month, 71. The month after that, it went to 83. The month after that, it went to 95. And I'm actually due for a dividend payout the day after I'm filming this video. So actually, I'll be getting a payout of how much. So remember this, it went from 60, 70, 71, 83, 95. And remember 95 cents, and then this recent payout is going to be, if we click my month activity here, $1.42. So it went up all the way up to 90 cents to $1.42. And now, since I own a lot more shares, if you go ahead and calculate this, I own 7.7 .7 shares, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull out my calculator, is if I take 7.7, 7771 times the dividend of 0.324 and I will get a dollar 66 so now this is even growing more so this payout what I'll be receiving in a check in two days is a dollar 42 and then the following month it will be around a dollar 60 a dollar 70 cents now I know it's really easy those of you that are watching this maybe you've been investing for a long time or maybe you're brand new and you don't really know how this dividend things works now the cool part is this does not count my capital gains my capital gains on the stock is over $40 but my dividends are contributing to that as well, right? So when we see these payments, when we go to my activity feed here and we click dividends and realty income, it's easy to look at this and say, wow, 60 cents, you're not getting paid hardly anything. Who wants to invest in a stock just to make 60 cents? Well, basically what this is doing is fueling my ownership of the company, not so much focused on the dollar amounts. Every time I'm getting this, I am buying another share of realty income. I get this, I'm buying more shares of realty income, buying this, buying more, and you just see the pattern that it goes along. And if we want to sort here by all my dividends, I want to go ahead and fast forward to the first page, or should say rewind. 
you see a lot of my payouts. A lot of them were very small, and they're gradually starting to go up over time, just like with realty income. Now, some of these stocks that I originally had, some of them I've not kept since the beginning, like for example, MAA, Foot Locker is not the same, but a lot of these stocks I've kept since the beginning, and a lot of them are growing quite significantly. And you see a lot of these payouts were well under a dollar, a lot of them even under 50 cents, like Apple, for example, 11 cents, Verizon, 34, Next Era Energy, 44 cents. And we go ahead and fast forward to today's payouts, and they're starting to go up. You see a lot of these are over a dollar, especially in the most recent activity in the last month or so. You see, instead of a lot of 20 cents and 30 cents, now you're starting to see a lot more $3.60, $1.36, $1.25, You see how this is steadily starting to go up. And just to give an example, so we saw Verizon. We saw the first page here. Verizon, its first payout was $0.34 cents to me. But if we click the activity fee here, in its most recent payout, it went from $0.34 cents to $0.59. It's steadily going up. And let's go ahead and give Broadcom. Broadcom is my largest investment. Let's see how Broadcom is doing. Broadcom's payout has went all the way up from $2.20 all the way up to $3.60. And I'm sure the next payout will probably somewhere be around $5 or $6. But anyways, you guys get the point. When you're investing in these companies, it's good to focus on companies that are growing their dividends. And just in the past six months that I've owned these companies, I would say out of the 27 stocks I own, I want to say roughly at least half of these companies have raised their dividends since I started. Just to name off a few, just to go through, I know Honeywell has raised their dividend, Verizon just raised their dividend, Duke Energy has, Starbucks did last week. I know that Qualcomm raised their dividend, Next Era Energy has multiple times, Store Capital, Altria. Actually, the more I think about it, I think probably two-thirds of these companies have raised the dividends in just the past six months that I've owned them. So owning dividend growth stocks really start to add up over the long run. And that's something that I've really started to learn over the past six months. And you see my capital gains here. Starting from $1,472 that first day in the red that I invested, I deposited $1,500 to the platform. And if we see the gradual uptrend from $1,700, now we're up to 1900 on a big spike up here. We keep going. We break 2000 right here on May 8th. We keep going, keep going. Now we're up to 2200. Keep on going a little further. Now we're up to 2500 on June 3rd. Keep going. A little uptrend goes a little stagnant from downturn in the market up to 2600. The things start to really take take off right around here. 2800, 2900. We start to get around 3000 here in late July. We start going further. 3200, 3300. Now we're up to 3500 on August 17th. Keep on going further, 36, 37, 38, 39, and now we're up to 4,000. I make two big deposits in the month of September and October. So we go from 4,000 up to 5,000 in September, and we trickle up higher from some more deposits as well as some share price growth up to 54.75 and make another big deposit of 6,500 is where we're at now and we are all the way up today to almost $7,000 and of this $7,000 I have contributed $5,500. So we're looking at about $1,500 worth of gains from referrals, from dividends, and from other things as well. But overall guys the portfolio is growing very nice and I just wanted to briefly mention this with IBM stop coming up next in the news that we're going to cover. So IBM which spins off its IT infrastructure unit and the stock roars higher. So with IBM, you see a lot of companies that do not pay out nearly as much as IBM, including most of my holdings. It currently has a dividend yield of over 5%. So considering today's market with treasury bonds yielding 1%, 1.5%, pretty much all treasuries or all forms of fixed income are yielding under 2%. So unless you have such a large portfolio that you can live off of 1% just fine, realistically investing in equities and getting five times or more that amount is really appealing for an equity investor. So with IBM, they've been struggling recently, but this infrastructure unit being spin off really gives shareholders an opportunity to focus on the growth category rather than its old dying, unfortunately, enterprise business. Now with IBM, I sold out of it in September. We go to the research tab here, or excuse me, if we click the activity tab here, and then we search IBM and we pull up the recent activity. On September 17th of 2020, I sold IBM at $124 a share, right? And the reason why I sold out of IBM was for a few reasons. It's really good to look at this Red Hat acquisition and say, okay, they're spinning this off. Red Hat is growing at double digit rates. And I think that they're going to continue to do that in the future, right? I think that Red Hat will continue to grow. I think that it will be very profitable from Red Hat in the future. There's only one problem. Red Hat right now currently makes up about $1 billion in revenue a quarter, so about $4 billion in revenue a year. But let's go ahead and look at the last four years of the income statement for IBM. And these two reasons of why I sold it, the balance sheet and the income statement. I love the yield. I think it's maintainable. But these numbers are not acceptable. 
80 billion worth of revenue in 2016. These numbers are in thousands, by the way, so just add three zeros. So 79.9 billion in revenue. The next year, they did 79.1, a drop off. The next year, they did 79.5, a little bit higher, but still not as high as what it was in 2016, two years ago. The following year, they had a steep drop off to 77.1. Okay, so you see the trend here from almost 80 billion in revenue in 2016 all the way down to 77, a huge drop off in revenue. And while they're losing revenue, they're increasing their payout. Like I said, if I go back here and I search IBM and I pull up the stock and we go to their last five years, let's look at the payout, the dividend. It goes from $1.30, a raise in dividends up to $1.40, to $1.50, to $1.57, $1.62, and then a teeny tiny raise here in 2020 to $1.63. And the reason why that was not risen very much, the reason why that's struggling, is because their revenues are declining and the only thing that they have to try to gasp up for air is their life raft which is red hat now red hat is doing great it's growing nice but when you look at this they have 80 billion roughly in revenue and only 4 billion of that is red hat so of those numbers let's say they do 80 billion in revenue and four of that comes from red hat you're looking at five percent of the company's revenue the 95 percent of the company is still coming from its traditional old school enterprise business and that is not something that i like now, okay, you might be saying to yourself, they might be decreasing revenues, but maybe they have a stack balance sheet. Maybe they're ready and maybe they're prepared for any and all recessions or booming bull markets or really anything that gets thrown at them, okay? So this is quarterly. This is updated quarterly. And this was updated June 30th, the last time that they reported earnings. So a couple months ago. So this is after the pandemic. And just go ahead and keep this in mind. This is pretty much how they've looked on their balance sheet for years now, as you can see some of their past history. So cash and cash equivalents, $12.1 billion and $2 billion in short-term investments. So 13.2 roughly, 13.2 billion in cash. 13 billion in cash and long-term debt is 55 billion. 55 billion. That is so much higher than 13 billion, right? That is literally like four, four and a half times higher than that than it is in cash and cash equivalents. When the debt is four plus times higher, it is not something that is completely out of control, but it is not really healthy. But when you factor in the fact that they already have a little bit of a leverage balance sheet with the fact that they're reducing revenues, things start to really get ugly. And I think that this company will be able to maintain its dividend in the long run. But that is not to say that this company won't really struggle over time as its dividend really starts to struggle. And I think the share price has shown the same thing as well as it's down about 30% on a money weighted return over the last five years. And I think these reasons are why this company is struggling. And I think it is going to take a long time and a lot, and I mean a lot of growth for Red Hat to pick up if they want to get this company back on its feet. But regardless, that's my opinion with IBM. It's not something I'd really focus on if you're focused on dividend growth. But if you just want a yield play, if you just want a little bit of a risky stock, kind of like that of like an AT&T, maybe a turnaround play, I think that IBM is a great buy just for its yield. I think they'll probably be able to maintain that with their awesome liquidity. Okay, now, now that that's over, let's go ahead and go over the Fed's balance sheet, right? This is the total assets of the Federal Reserve, and this is the official federalreserve.gov website. So this is the updated website that the government posts every single day, right? So let's go ahead and look at these assets. The assets was $900 billion in 2008. And then the financial crisis happened and all forms of stimulus came to play. And they have over $2 trillion worth of their balance sheet now, right? And then we kind of trickle down. We kind of stay flat. It gradually uptrends throughout 2011, 2012. And then a steady upcline all the way up until about late 2014, early 2015, right? So we're here. We're at 2015. We're three, four, five, six years out of a recession, right? What should be happening at this point? is the balance sheet should start looking a lot healthier. They should start deleveraging their balance sheet. And now while this didn't happen, 2020 happens. Let's fast forward to 2020. We had a little downturn here where the balance sheet started to get a little bit healthier. They got down to about 3.7 trillion. Remember, I'm saying this with a T, not a B. These numbers are in millions. So 3.7 trillion, and then it goes back up to four, kind of trickles the same right here. And then 2020 happens. February and March of 2020 and obviously stimulus packages and quantitative easing and lots of other things start to take place and this goes from about 4 trillion all the way up to 7 plus 7 plus trillion dollars now hold up let's pause for a second I don't care what you think about the Fed I don't care what you think about the president what you think about the economy or the GDP or really anything in between I just want to point out something 7 trillion dollars on the balance sheet is a lot I'm not saying it's unattainable. I'm not saying they can't get it back to normal. I'm just going to point out, I think anybody can agree with me in saying that $7 trillion is a lot. Even when we're talking about the United States government, $7 trillion is something that 
I don't know if it's going to start getting out of hand or start really start affecting the economy in the way the government operates. But regardless, we saw the way that Jerome Powell talked about this. He is not worried whatsoever. Now, I wanted to talk in my opinions in both support of this and against this. Now, my reason to be in support of this, let's go ahead and look at this GDP number. You see, we have downturns going all the way back to 1882, so a really far ways out. You see that they had downturn. You see that we had downturns where we had GDP go down 10%, 15%. 20%, 25%. And then as we get to the new modern eras, GDP starts to get a lot more stable. It's not nearly as jagged. It's kind of just a steady uptrend. And we had the Great Recession. Now let's go ahead and compare this to 2008, 2009. 2009 was one of the worst times that this country has ever seen. Ever. Now remember, GDP only went down a few percent, three, four, five percent during that time. Let's compare that to today's numbers. <laughs> In this quarter of 2020, we went down negative. 32.9%. I'm going to say it again just because of how crazy it is. We went down 32.9%. We lost almost a third of the economy in three months. That is a huge downturn and pretty much blew out any estimates you could have ever made a year ago. If you would have told me a year ago, you would have said, okay, hey, Jordan, by the way, we're in 2019. I just wanted to let you know a year from now, in the second quarter of 2020, we're going to lose 33% of our economy. I would have said, what? You're crazy. There's no way. That is beyond estimates, right? That is nothing that is anything that is remotely realistic. But here we are. So in light of that, I think that it is okay for the Fed to not really worry so much about the balance sheet and focusing on job growth, focusing on getting jobs out there and helping the people in need and getting stimulus packages to the people who need it most. Now, I think that that's important, but here's what I don't like about this. So let's go ahead and close out this GDP graph here and let's go ahead and look at this chart. What is really interesting to me is that we are doing nothing but uptrending. We had that one year in 2018 where we went down a little bit. But what's important here is as we get throughout 2020, 2021, do whatever you want. Create as many jobs as you want. Grow the economy, yada, yada. Now, talking about 2022, 2023, 2024, and beyond, you should focus on getting this number as low as possible. I would like to see this number get cut in half. I would like to see this number get cut down 75%, 80%. So that way, when we do inevitably have another downturn, because like as Kevin O'Leary always likes to say, when poo-poo eventually hits the fan, you got to be able to cover your butt, right? So when poo-poo does eventually hit the fan, you better be able to have a steady balance sheet and be able to do more quantitative easing and lots of other things for the economy to help grow us and get us back on our feet whenever another downturn eventually takes place. But thank you guys so much for watching. Like I said, if you want to follow along with me and my journey, if you want to join me on this investing journey, we are growing our dividends dividends every single month, every single quarter, every single year. And I would invite you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to watch me update these four charts every single month, be fully transparent in every single thing that I do. Show my buys, my sales, my dividends, my everything, right? Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to invest in this portfolio yourself, it has a 3.3 roughly percent dividend yield. And I have 27 holdings in my portfolio. And these are the weightings that I have. And I would invite you to also refer to M1 Finance. If you're worried about your safety and security, there's never been any kind of security link with M1 Finance that I know of. And they're overall, regardless, just a great platform to invest in. So be the 47th person to sign up and go ahead and get a free 10 bucks for doing so. So thank you guys so much for watching if you made it all the way to the end. If you want to do other things with me, if you want to like set up a mentoring call or ask a question down below, go ahead and leave it down below in the comment section. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll speak to you guys next time.